Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and we'll see if more people join throughout. So what I wanted to kind of go over today with you was kind of my experience with taking Microsoft certifications, and hopefully what you will be able to learn today can apply to not just Microsoft certifications or maybe AWS or CompTIA or any other certification out there, but just to learning things in general. So I'm going to kind of go over a story of how I did, what I did, and how I think you can apply it, and how I've applied it outside of just certifications. So first, I'm going to start off kind of, I'll have a quote here, kind of made me think of, you know, in a dark place, we find ourselves and a little more knowledge lights our way. So right now, with COVID and all the quarantine going on, our lives are kind of disrupted. It's kind of a dark place, kind of made me think of this kind of quote, and that you know, if we focus, if you can focus your energy on learning and investing in yourself, maybe they'll create a little light at the end of the tunnel, no matter where you are. And if you've been laid off recently, or you have just started a new job, or you've been in your current job, you're not sure how things are going to go. So I try and always find and make the glass, you know, half full versus half empty. So hopefully that will help. So the first thing I wanted to kind of show was that Yes, this is, you know, no clickbait, no, uh, I think this is the exams that I took, the data I took them from my transcript, and I started with the data exams, and then went to the architect exams, then took an Azure Fundamental exam, which is kind of backwards, what I recommend, but then there was an AI designing and implementing an Azure AI solution. Now, it's not my first set of certification exams. I started taking exams back in uh, 2000, I believe, so I had around 12 certifications before this series. So no, it's not new to me, but it can be done. So hopefully what we'll cover today and what you'll, you'll kind of learn a little bit about is Microsoft certification overview, uh, identifying what's on an exam, what's the exam process, like check-in and everything. What are some practice exams or tools you can use to kind of learn about the exam and go through the study motions. Then what are some study and note-taking tips? This is the area that you can apply to not just Microsoft certifications or any other certification series, but learning in general. Maybe you need to learn the new business unit you're on, the new team you're on, or anything in life. Say you want to learn some wood shop or wood carving or anything outside. Uh, you can apply the same thing out there to hobbies. And then kind of what exam should you start with? So hopefully you, I can share some insights and wisdom. So to start off with Microsoft certifications, they have uh, series on programming languages. Uh, they have them on Python, C Sharp. Now the C Sharp exams are going to expire in January, 2021. I don't know what they will replace them with, but I would stay tuned. I would imagine they would replace them with something. Then there's office exams, uh, AI exams, as you saw in my transcript, data engineering and data scientist. That's kind of working with Power BI, data querying, data scientist is around machine learning and training your models. DBA, anything related to uh, SQL Server and doing typical DBA activities. Then there's DevOps, using Azure DevOps and creating boards, creating pipelines, working with repos and managing all the things and automating uh, activities. Then uh, the Azure, this is the largest chunk of exams that are available. These are kind of administrative exams, developer exams around Azure, security, and there's a lot of data series exams that I showed on my transcript. So the first place to kind of get a really in-depth detailed guide about all these exams that are out there is I created a bit.ly link uh, called MS Cert Guide. When you navigate to any certification and you're looking up to see what's on the exam, as we'll kind of uh, go over, there's a bottom section with all these resources. It kind of changes per exam, but they generally have this same one you want to jump to is Training and Certification Guide. They will have, it's like 95 slides, so it's like one for every exam. It kind of overviews what's in the exam. It's a quick go-to guide. So I'd recommend looking at that and kind of going through the slides after this. 
So next, you know, what's on exam is really key identifying and most people don't know or don't know how to find out, well, this is a target exam I want to learn about. I want to set this as a goal. How do I find out what's on the exam and what to study and how to build my study plan? So when you navigate and search for Azure certification exams or any of the Microsoft certification exam, exams under Learn, uh, Microsoft Learning site, they will see you'll see a typical breakout like this, a page that says, this is for the Microsoft certified Azure Developer Associate. So this is the AZ uh, 204 exam. And it tells you that uh, some basic overviews of what's in the exam, what to expect, maybe some background information, but it's not enough detail for you to kind of really start your studying off of. So what you want to go to is a section right below that that's going to outline, uh, you see the skills measured, that's the main topic areas that are on the exam. What we want to do is download the certificate certification skills outline. This will bring up a PDF document that will show you all of the bullet items, the high level things we just saw, and a breakout with sub items and like sub sub items that will align and show you all the details of what's on the exam. So for example, for developing Azure Compute Solutions, this is gonna make up 25 to 30% of the exam. And an exam, you typically need 70% to pass. So you can kind of gauge you maybe what you know or quickly know by assessing it. And I've got some other resources I'll share at the end that allows you, that some other people I've come across have built to kind of give you uh, a quick self-assessment on if the, how prepared are you possibly for this exam. So in this example, under implementing IS solutions, there's provisioning VMs, config, configuring VMs, uh, some Azure Kubernetes services. So you can see kind of how it kind of breaks out. Now, that's where it's to find out what's on the exam. Now, as far as learning, preparing, I always like cheap and free uh, first. And so underneath every exam, there's going to be an online free that points to the Microsoft Learning uh, path. And it's a series of modules. These modules will be documentation that's covered from Microsoft Docs. And also they will have portions of them that will have interactive screens and interactive sessions. So you might have to go to Azure portal. They'll set up and spin up for you, give you a temporary kind of a, a isolated environment so you don't have to have a subscription and certain topics might uh, will require you to kind of work with a command line. So they'll spin all that up for you. So it's a good way to kind of get started uh, in that area. So uh, now there is, uh, and you can do instructor-led paid training. Of course, that's more costly. Sometimes companies will pay for that. Um, I prefer the self-paced because I feel I can do it a lot faster than waiting for <clears throat> a session to be scheduled. But different people have different learning styles. So just know that that's available out there. And at the end, there are other ways to learn that I'm going to review some links and some outside uh, providers that are really good. So next is kind of what's the exam process, okay? You decided you want to take the exam. So if you've ever taken any kind of standardized test, you know, it's good to know what's it like to go into that testing environment. And we're gonna focus on today is reviewing the cell phone at taking the test online at home or kind of private area, since most of the test centers are shut off for right now and you have to do it from home. And these seven exams that I took were the first ones I took uh, self-proctored or proctored at home. And so the first thing there's an, uh, this is from the Pearson View uh, testing site. You wanna make sure you've got a good functioning home computer with a webcam, internet connection. There's ability to run a system test. So you can check that out before you kind of even pursue kind of, you know, going further down this path. You want to make sure when you take the exam that you don't have any kind of outside noises like outside TV from next door room. I've got a uh, little puppy and cats. Those are kind of less of a concern, but you don't want to have your dog running in and out. You can't. And if you're in a locked off, you know, room, closed off room, which you need to be in, you want to make sure nobody kind of knocks on the door. So like I've got kids, so I make sure I, with it being an online exam, I can take it much later at night or much earlier in the morning. So I take mine typically around, I schedule them around 11.30 at night. That way my kids are asleep and it's less likely for an interruption. 
So that's what works best for me. And so you'll click, here's a link. You'll go to home.pearsonview.com slash Microsoft slash one view. And I've not taken any other uh, home tests from like AWS or CompTIA or anything else. Uh, so I imagine they'd be pretty similar. So you click to test my system here and then bring up a little test. So it's going to test your microphone. It's going to test your webcam. It's going to test your basic internet speed. And so from that, if that works, you'll know that you're good to go and proceed with really kind of building your game plan for what exam to cover first. So next, you know, what's, what does your room need to be like? So as you can see, this is the room I take my stuff in. It's a big art room with a share with my family. There's a bunch of stuff all over here. And my desk normally looks like this. Uh, you know, this morning I've got a printer, a second monitor, coffee cups, pens, and everything. So when I'm going to take the exam, I take my printer, I unplug it, put it behind me. I take my second monitor, I unplug it, put it behind me. I take my pencils, external hard drive, my iPad, any kind of notes, and all those things off my desk so it's clear. Now to the right, I've got other things and don't have anything in the wall in front of me. And so what you're gonna do is when you register and start the exam, they're gonna make you take pictures from behind, looking forward, forward looking back and left and right. They wanna make sure you don't have any test material hanging up. And sometimes they might ask you to spin your webcam around to make sure nothing is there. And so during the check-in process, they're gonna make you, uh, you can send a link to your phone, they'll start the little app and you'll take those pictures. You'll take a picture of your ID. I use my state uh, US driver's license. Take a picture of the front and the back, a picture of my face, and they'll put all those things in there. And then you'll, uh, once that's accepted and validated, then you can kind of start the exam and a proctor will sometimes chat with you and see if they have any other questions about seeing your room before you can pre proceed with the exam and your exam will be kicked off and you'll be in exam mode. So the check-in process is pretty painful. And if you schedule your exam, like I do till around 11, 30 at night, you can start the process 30 minutes early. I always recommend starting that check-in process at the earliest point you can. That way, if any kind of hiccup happens with kind of taking the photos or their mobile app or anything, you've got all the time available. Usually it takes about five to 10 minutes max to do the check-in process. Sometimes there might be a little hiccup with a mobile app, uh, might crash, and you might have to kind of just resend yourself the link. And it's it's very self-explanatory. So I hope that kind of really demystifies. Now, first, I was pretty worried about taking the exams at home because of being used to a controlled environment and not one of my kids. But after kind of doing it several times, I, I really enjoy it, and it really works out well. So next is you know, practice exams. Well, how can I go through practicing exam? If you're taking an SAT, ACT, MCAT, or any type of exam like that, typically you can get your hands on a practice exam to kind of get a feel for the questions, the style of questions, and what's the whole environment like. So one of the providers of a practice exam is Measure Up. What they have is the ability to have a free demo that gives us a really good insight. So you can search on their site. And at the end, I'll have a link to my GitHub with all the links of all these resources. And so what you would do is you go to try demo. And for every exam, they give you five questions you can take. They give you a little insight. And so what you wanna do is choose practice exam. If you choose certification, when you get the software, even now, it's a timed event. You can't see the answers and when you're done, then they try to reveal your score. So, and so what you're gonna choose here is randomize your task questions. This, you have more options here with the full purchase version. Like they'll show you the number of questions you can choose from. Say there's 150 questions, maybe you only want to do 50 questions. You can choose that option. And here's the real key area. So at the bottom, in the middle, there's a show option. So to show objectives rather, that's where you would want to choose from the exam breakout. We saw that there's like five key areas in this exam. So you can choose just to study one of those bullet areas and just the test questions in that. That's usually how I start off. I pick out one of those areas because it might be 30 to 50 questions. When I'm going through for the first time, that might take a couple hours to kind of really read through them patiently and look at the information. And so the second key thing is I always auto display answers to any responses. 
And what I like to do is when I get into the question, as we'll see, this is gonna help me kind of study at a faster uh, pace. So you choose those options that work for you and then kind of a start uh, page. Now, this from the real world is just slightly different and that you'll be asked, do you wanna start or not? Then they'll gonna go into kind of how well prepared are you for the exam? It's like five questions and then you can start the exam. They give you five minutes of that window to do that. It doesn't come out of your test taking time frame. And then you'll be presented with a question. And so one of the types of questions are kind of drop down. You'll have to use the drop downs to select the correct answer for each line item. And what's not clarified here is in the real world exam, typically the exam will say each of the choices, each, each uh, part of the answer is worth one point. This is a key thing to kind of uh, keep in the back of your mind if you're limited on time, because some questions are worth more than others. So in this example, you kind of walk through kind of the scenario, and this is a coding question since it's an Azure uh, developer exam. And then below, this is when you cl click show the answer, it's gonna show you for measure up all what makes the right answer the right answer and explanation. Then it'll give you an explanation of what makes the wrong answer the wrong answer. And usually one to more links on those topics to Microsoft Docs or a blog or some other key uh, resource. So it's really great. And so what I this is why I love show the answers because I look at the question, I try and answer it and it's gonna auto show me the results. And I can read both the so I'm learning about the correct choices and I'm learning about the distraction choices. So it's multiple areas at one time. And so here's another type of question. This question is uh, kind of a, you select either one or two and this one it says choose two actions. And we're gonna do a deep dive on this question on how to break it down and how to study for it at a later part in the study tips. And again, they're gonna show you the answers when you could show answer and then show the correct uh, responses. The next type is a drag and drop scenario. It's gonna look like this, or it might look at a different fashion when you have to drag something from the left to the right uh, box, but it's kind of a drag and drop. And this question is asking you to, what's the procedure and how to do something? It might be either three to five steps. And most of the time you have to put these in order and sometimes you don't. Then at the end of the exam, before the very before you're finished, it says, okay, you're ready to navigate off. Are you sure? Are you done? And the real exam will kind of let you know the same thing. And then in the end, it kind of shows your results of the practice exam. In the real world, it's just you pass or failed, and the first page shows you you need your score and what you need to pass. And then you would click another page to in order to see the score report, which is the bottom half here. So one of the other resources we talked about measure up, the other resource that's really good is Wiz Labs. Their practice exams, you can access to their site for $99 for a whole year. And that's all they're learning from any kind of topic and not just Microsoft, can be JavaScript, can be HTML, anything you'd imagine. And it's $99, they have practice exams, they have uh, labs, other great things. The practice exams I don't find as rich because of the way they show the answers and why the distractors are distractors. But from a cost perspective point, it's really good. Whereas a measure up exam, practice exam is usually 90 for 30 days. And if you wanna keep it permanently, it's around 110, $20. So it is a cost difference, but you know, I'd always try the cheaper option first. Now, sometimes some companies might reimburse you. So kind of another quote that comes to mind here is named must you fear before banish it you can from Yoda. Great wise one. So the thing is here, you know, a lot of people are, this is, might be new to you or this topic might be new to you. Don't be afraid of the exam. You know, the exam in a sense could be your free, your fear, the kind of just the process itself, acknowledge it and you can kind of pull yourself through that kind of mental hurdle and then, open your mind to learning more things. So study and note taking tips. So the main thing here is do or do not, there's no try. You've got to put effort and time into it. The main thing you wanna do is run these practice exam questions, understand you know, the concepts in them, 
the wording, the phrasing, identifying distractors and how distractors are worded, and overall the general topics of the exam. And the other way you can practice is going through the learn modules. They're free and it's really a good, good way to get started. So one of the other security tips, uh, sorry, uh, training tips and study tips I use is NLP and LEM. I'm not sure if you all have uh, heard of these things. Has anybody heard of uh, neural linguistic programming and lateral eye movement? Basically, different sections of your brain are triggered for different types of information processing. Certain sections of your brain are triggered for visual, certain for auditory, and different type of things. So we're gonna focus on is visual, visual learning, and how you can enhance your visual learning to improve the speed of your short-term, and it will build up some long-term memory capabilities as well. Lateral eye movement is based upon where you position your eyes, upper right, upper left, will enhance and focus those brain areas. And this came out with studies in the 1960s and 70s. Some people are uh, kind of not so much, but I've started practicing this back in the military. I learned it in high school, didn't practice it, was awful in high school, went in the military and was in a, a high advanced school and needed to kind of learn a lot of information quickly. So I said, let me use a tip a teacher had given me. And so basically what you do is you look at anything, your information, your notes, your a uh, just maybe a piece of art or anything. And then you can close your eyes and you move them to the upper right hand side. And so the visual, there's visual remembered and visual constructed. Constructed is if you need to visualize something in a hypothetical way. Visual remembering is if you want to kind of recall a picture of something. Now the chart here is for right-handed individuals. If you're left-handed, it's going to be opposite. But if you find yourself certain, um, like I write right-handed, but like with soccer, I'm mainly left-footed. So if you kind of, you have to play with what kind of way upper right or left-handed, right or left-handed kind of way pattern works for you. But basically, you would look at some information and you would close your eyes, move them to the upper right-hand side or left-hand side, where it works for you, and just try to recall that information as a, as a picture. Then you can see there's auditory and other things that work as well, but we're just gonna focus on the visual. Now, sure, you're like, okay, this is just crazy information, but train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. This is some, it might be some, you know, weird, you know, uh, snake skin oil kind of thing you might think of, but I promise you it will work. I use this in college to, and for these series exams to memorize 40, 50 pages of notes in a couple of hours. Now granted, I've already done the study work. I've already kind of put the notes in the format I'm gonna show you, but reviewing those notes, I was able to visually memorize every detail in a couple of hours on 40 to 50 pages of notes. So if you look at this picture, when we're taught a lot of times in languages, it's like A is for apple. You show your little child the A, and we're visually showing them a picture of an apple. We show them B for a bird and cat for dog. So we're automatically have been taught these things, but maybe not precisely directly. So let's kind of practice this a little bit. What comes to your mind when I say Mona Lisa or Eiffel Tower? Just pause for a minute and you know, just think. And so did you picture something like this? Did you already use some sort of visual recall ability of picturing something? You most likely did, you know, if you didn't, that's fine. This, this approach might not work for you. Might be more of an auditory kind of a learning style predominant, but you can still practice this mechanism to improve visual learning. So if we go off a basic note page, you know, I took some notes on cognitive services, whatever, your topic is, it's plain, it's boring, it's got no visual pop to it. And so it's very hard to create a picture in your in your brain. It's not as bright as the Mona Lisa or the Eiffel Tower. So one of the key things I like to do is I'm gonna use blue ink on white paper. And typically you go through an organization kind of 
outline, if you're reading a book or you're taking notes or you're revising your notes from your instructor or anything you kind of learned about, this nice little neat outline. And then the key thing for me has always been to use consistent highlighting. So for me in my studies, I was always using blue for an Azure product since it's blue, the color scheme. And for a sub item list, I would use the same, like a pink. If I had a definition, I might do it like an orange with a green underline. So if I knew if I was looking for a definition in my memory, I knew that color combination. If I was looking for a subset of categories, I would use the same color. So whatever works for you, but you don't have to go crazy and overboard. It's kind of a balance. So that's an approach I've always used. But I wanted something faster. I didn't want to have to take all the time to getting all my nodes correct and then have them go back and reorganize them. I wanted to do something fast. So during my early studies, uh, before kind of uh, studying for these, you know, I'd heard about graph databases. So I said, hmm, what if I could use graph database as an inspiration? So if you can comment, how many people have heard of graph databases? It's okay if you haven't, um, but typically have heard of traditional like SQL or kind of structured databases with a table with columns and names and maybe first, second, third normal form or NoSQL with row IDs and those type of things. But a graph database is basically a series of entities with a relationship arrow between them. So an example, on the left-hand side, we have a tweet with a user that can have mentions, or you have a source, or you have a user that can do a post a tweet, those kind of activities. It's a quick way to kind of map some information out. On the right-hand side, we've got kind of like a, any kind of sporting league. You've got a league that can have an, an auction or a contract or a conference with division and sub items. And so those, the lines are the relationships or the verbs, if you will. So I said, hmm, what if I could use that to kind of quickly take notes? And so here's an example of one of my note pages in the center. Um, so one, I didn't have to be overly organized. I could, as I learned things, I could come to a page about that topic and quickly add things. And so we had before the super outline item, what Azure Cognitive Services and the different types of searching services like Face API, Bing image search, Bing visual search. So I just create a bubble, you know, try to an item, you know, somewhat neatly for me to recall, and then highlight and circle and then draw the details off to the side and the arrows for relationships and maybe a key verb off of those things. Um, some of the shorthand notations you might see in this picture are an exclamation point. So I took that from my programming background and used like a knot. Like this is maybe. So if in this example, there's uh, there's a, a one key that you can't do a contact model or anomaly detection. So maybe it's you know something that might be a distractor. So if you learn the opposite of, hey, this is not uh, applicable to it, the exclamation point works for me. So it might be other things you can work utilize. So let's take an example question we reviewed earlier. So here's a multiple choice question and we saw before and we saw the answer. So the thing is, well, how do you know what to put on your graph database? Or how do you know what to use your shorthand notation for? So what sticks out to me is, okay, we've got Azure Active Directory. So in this, for the simplest here, I put a blue uh, circle around it, and we've got AD basic licenses, which is Active Directory, and then we got multi-factor authentication, kind of a key, component there and in the green, I've highlighted two kind of other key factors in the question. Two actions, because we need to answer two things to make the answer correct, to get all the full credit. And two is current use, they currently use this. So what are they using now versus what they need to go to or so there's a clarification. In the questions I highlighted in purple, key things that stand out to me about the different parts of the question. So the first one is referring to a P1 licensing. So in Azure, it's you have different licensing. So there, we could see they're already on a basic license. So will they need to go to a P1? That's a possibility. Do they need to configure B2B? That's another kind of configuration option, not so much a licensing tier. Then they have to do an application proxy. I'm like, hmm, what is that? So then we have a new conditional access policy. So that's kind of key things that stick out. And so I'll, I won't be writing my notes yet, but I'll kind of 
look at these factors, one for taking notes and two for answering the test question. And so in the answers, I'm gonna look to, okay, here are the same purple blocks about those products or those feature aspects. So it explains why you would need the Azure AD Premium P1 license. And in the gray box that I put some sub uh, factors in there, MFA support, it's cost effective. That's a key thing in a lot of the Azure exams, you, or Microsoft exams, you wanna know cost effectiveness, what's the most cost effective item uh, choice. Next is conditional access and the sub details there, B2B, and kind of explain so we can quickly see, okay, those are what stands out as a possibility of what to kind of bring into your notes. So I'm going to walk you through how, how I took this question and created notes for it. So one, we've got Azure AD, MFA, and basic from the top part of our question. Then I added, huh, okay, we got B2B, we got application proxy, we have conditional access policy. Those are other factors we saw in there. I haven't learned yet much about them. And then we can know, okay, there's a line between Azure AD and basic, that's a license type. And we know that P1 supports MFA, so we'll draw a line there. Next, we have some more information. Huh, well, conditional access policy. Well, we that allows us to do uh, allow, deny, or acquire MFA from the right up down below. And then conditional access policy allows you to have multiple conditions we learned about, usual location, device, and app. And as you can see, we're slowly building up our details just from one question on several different areas. Then the last of the details, oh, it's a web app. The web app works with an application proxy, which gives access to on-premises. So this here is the final picture of all the details from the question. So we're not just gonna study about Azure licensing, we're gonna learn all these other things at the same time with one question. And so when I finish highlighting this example, this is what it kind of looks like. I'm gonna have Azure, the product in blue. I'm gonna have the type of sublisting in pink for myself. And then I'll have other kind of highlighting, you know, orange. And then if it's a kind of a detail, very low level, I might use green consistently uh, for in this example. So you're like, okay, yeah, right. So um, so basically feel the force, Yoda says. So me, this means when you take an exam, learn anything new, trust in yourself, trust in your own abilities. Think back to anything else in your past that you have succeeded in and apply that to build your self-confidence. Taking these exams, learning anything new, getting through the challenges in your life are all you can, increase your chances of doing that by building upon your self-confidence. So for me, so my self-confidence came from uh, all these past exams I took. Each one is like building like, oh, I took this one exam. I know I can do it again. Or in college, hey, I took this hard math course. It was maybe harder for me. I mentally going into the same time. Or that, hey, I, you know, you know learned how to take a bar to a car and put it back together. So if, just find anything you were able to successfully do in the past or a challenging situation, apply that mentally. So for me, the last time I challenged myself, I took, I said, yeah, I'm gonna try and take two exams in one day. And so I did that. So kind of going to this next tier challenge of, let's see how fast I can do a series of exams. And so I took that past success and I took my past success of in college when I, I did school in three years, taking like 26, 28 hours a semester using these learning and visual memorization techniques that, hey, if I've done that, there's no reason I can't do this next challenge. So the question now is what exam do you start with? What exam makes sense for you? Where you are today, what you already know, and maybe where you wanna go, where you wanna push yourself to. The key thing is it's something you have to decide. I can give you guidance and provide you, you know, direction of where to go. And you can always reach me and contact me. I'll be glad to kind of walk through your individual situation. But one of the key areas I would suggest in is I'm gonna outline kind of four areas. So the entry level exams under majority of the Microsoft certifications are have a two letter code and dash 900. Those 900s are the introductory exams. 
those are great ones to start with. They're not super complicated. They don't ask a lot of deep scenarios. It's more of awareness. On the other side, if you don't have experience with those things, another exam type to start with is this uh, Python exam. They have for our reference the C-sharp exams, but those are going to expire. You still go after those and learn those. If that's an area of a, your strong ability, then go and tackle that. But this Python exam is an example of one of those areas. And uh, so what I have here is this bit.ly link to my uh, the Python search, a quick link for you to quickly find the details on this Python exam. So here's some of the Azure kind of fundamental exams. There's Azure Fundamentals. This covers a uh, high level about Azure overall. Various products, basically, uh, what is cloud services? What is IaaS versus PaaS? All the different kinds of install details. Then you have Azure Data Fundamentals. This is about the data products at a low basic level of what do they mean, what do they maybe intend to use for, and how to best apply them from a conceptual level. Then you have Azure AI Fundamentals. This is a new, the DP900 and AI100 just came out of beta and officially released. So Azure AI Fundamentals is kind of what do you use and how can you use AI tools inside of Azure to uh, move forward. And use and incorporate into your uh, website tools. So another area is the basics. So if these are kind of two business area categories. Power platform. Uh, this is really a cool set of tools that allows people to build kind of no code, no code type tools and solutions. There's a bunch of great resources out there, and I've got a link for an individual that's kind of going to break an exam and where to kind of study for that, along with the Microsoft Learn stuff. So that's great to kind of learn. Uh, and then we have Dynamics, which is our contact management system, our business system. And then you have the Office Product Suite Fundamental. So those are kind of really good areas to start with. Now, if you've got more Azure experience, maybe you say, oh, I'm going to go more challenging. Maybe you've already taken one of the 900 exams. Then if you are uh, already kind of more developer mode, then take the developer exam. If you've done more infrastructure or you're confident in virtual networking, then the Azure Administrator is a good exam. Um, now, you don't have to start with those, but those are typically the best ones. Now, for the data exams, like the DP200 and 201, uh, what I recommend is for if you're going to use the measure up uh, practice exams, I would recommend studying both of those because any measure up exam, they can't have an infinite amount of questions because the cost to kind of build all those things, and they can't cover every little sub-item detail. But the two exams together will give you over 300 questions that, and those exams overlap heavily. The same thing with the infrastructure exam and as a security exam, they overlap a heavy amount. So sometimes you can pair exam topics, and not even just from Measure Up, but WizLabs or anybody else uh, to kind of learn from both those things. So kind of, you know, one of my final quotes is, you know, always pass on what you've learned. So I've learned a lot of things from a lot of great other people that have built out these study materials. And I remember the first individual that kind of got me on to certification training about 20 years ago. And I was nervous as heck and used a similar product to measure up. And that kind of got me on my learning path. Now, to me, the certification exams are great, even if you don't want to take the exam. If you just want to want to kind of learn about the topic, it provides a great roadmap. A lot of times we're not, you know, really diligent and we don't know where to start or we kind of bounce all around the place and kind of covering this subtopic and this subtopic. It will give you a nice roadmap on what to learn about for any kind of exam, any kind of product knowledge or any kind of sub area. So that's one of the key things I like about it. So next, it kind of finally, here's my Twitter handle. And I create a bit.ly link for MS Cert Fast Track. I've got a list to all the resources I utilize uh, from other Microsoft MVPs and other testing providers that are out there. So another individual I use is a friend of mine uh, over in Glasgow, England. His name is, he's got a blog called Azure Greg. He's got a GitHub page that lists a series per exam kind of study resources or where they're at. And people can kind of go and add more and do pull requests, then there's a gentleman by Scott Duffy that I utilize. He's got a Udemy course 
that I've paid for. It's, you can get it for like $12. There's one for each of the exams. And what I used to use it for was I used to spend a lot of time driving. And so I would use it since an area I had some familiar after I watched it, I would use it as a podcast. I really wouldn't worry about watching it. I'm driving it, but just hearing it again, again, helped me trying to practice my audio audio memory capabilities because it's a weaker side of me, but it's also another way to kind of learn something and reuse the same product in a different way. Then there's a self-assessment tool by a gentleman that runs Build Five Nines, and you can select any exams and it'll kind of walk you through each of those little sub items. You can kind of grade yourself on how much you know or don't know or how aware you are or not aware and kind of see, well, how much mentally do you have to build? So the thing is, well, how do you do this in 30 days? Thing is, if you've got the capability to access these resources, the thing is just start, 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 start. And I'll be glad to help you kind of build maybe your own kind of tailored plan or where to go from. And the thing is, start learning, start practicing, take notes in a shorthand way, and try these new techniques to visually memorize them. And I guarantee you, you'll have a greater visual recall during the exam. Because most of the times I imagine, I remember before I started really practicing this, when I would be in an exam of any kind of type, not so much more in high school, I'd take an exam, like a chemistry test. I'm like, man, I remember that formula, but I remember it's like somewhere over here in my notes on the left-hand side, but I can't remember what it was. It's all foggy. So you already have that capability mentally inside of there. So if you just practice this, you will allow to see your notes as pieces of art, as a picture, just like the Mona Lisa, and they will stand out vividly if you use these kind of basic techniques and practice it. So what questions do you all have? I'd be glad to you know, try and answer anything that comes to mind. And so I'll stay on for the remainder of the time to see uh, how I can help out. And I hope you all have had a great day. And I want to say thank you for all the uh, people and the companies that helped support it, uh, TechFest 2020 uh, Pittsburgh, all the sponsors. Megan, any questions uh, from you or thoughts? Have you taken any exams before? Oh, great, Megan. Great. Yeah, reach out to me anytime. I'll be glad wherever you're starting at in your track, your, you know, your overall kind of, uh, you're just starting out to middle. I'll be glad to help out and maybe give you some guidance or free resources to kind of get started. So the certification exam, I forgot to mention that in the links. Great, great question. So I don't know, I wasn't aware if Oracle was offering free search or not for free, but it's great. Microsoft, because of the COVID situation, is going to offer a series, mostly the Azure and Business Dynamics exams, in September for $15. So it's a great opportunity to, right now, identify an exam you want to try or two you want to try if it's your first time. And in September, you can register for the exams for $15. In the link, and I search Fast Track, there is my GitHub page. There's a link to the article that Microsoft published that's going to have all the $15 exams. So you can register in, fifth, in September for any time, I think through December or January, for the Azure exams. And even if you don't have, at least book when that comes up for $15, book at least one just to kind of get an experience on one of them. It's definitely worthwhile. But thank Anna. Thanks, Anna. But uh, yeah, I'll search and see if Oracle's got some uh, free ones too, and I'll put a link in that GitHub. If you happen to have one, Anna, if you want to do a pull request on that, go ahead, right ahead. You know, glad to kind of share, you know, free resources. Uh, so one of the other vigils is, uh, that I forgot to mention, too, is Tech Trainer Tim. I'm pretty active on Twitter, and he's got a YouTube series, video series on the AZ900. So definitely check that out if you want to want to be aware of this cloud terminology. No matter, you know, it's a great place to kind of, especially you may again, you know, you kind of discovered in programming, but it'd be great to kind of learn about cloud 
technologies and some of the terminology and how that's different and what you can and can't do with it. Great insight. And the same thing would apply to wherever you're going to eventually work in that if they use Google or Oracle Cloud or AWS, those are all it can give you good insight into those topics. A lot of their products are very similar. We might call it one thing with Microsoft Azure versus MES, but really good free learning there. There's also a bunch of Microsoft YouTube channels. There's like Azure Friday, uh, Channel 9. So a lot of free things out there you don't have to pay for in order to get ramped up on. What other questions do you have? Anything comes to mind? So how many of you, if you think you're gonna, you'll take a stab at trying this uh, visual learning approach? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, basically do it works. Um, and if you're already doing the outlining and color scheming, just practice a couple pages. You know, and like I said, visualize it, close your eyes, walk into the room, and later on try just recalling it. And then in your mind, don't worry about it as information. Just treat it as a picture. You're trying to remember, you know, memorize maybe a piece of art like my child drew for me, or treat it as like that because you know your, my kids' art is kind of crazy and kind of. Uh, weird and sometimes not always identifiable what it is. But if you can treat it like that, break it down your mind. It's, it's just art. It's just a picture. It's not kind of, you know, raw details. And it will really break down that mental barrier. All right, everybody. Thank you for staying with me and jumping into this session. I hope you get something of value out of it. And you can always reach me to help uh, questions around anything and make sure you take time to go visit the sponsors and see what information they have to share and chat with all the people in the in the event since it's kind of you know a virtual uh, event day type of session and since an environment went with the COVID and the pandemic and I hope everyone stays safe. Bye. You're welcome.